tales for dark nights. up and prepare to be unsettled. You have left behind your safety and reality and fallen into darkness. There is no escape and there is no reprieve. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast Season 2 Episode 4. I am GM Danielson your guide through these twisted worlds of the most disturbed imaginations. Now it is time. Follow me into oblivion. To awaken something lingering at the foot of your bed is bad enough, but when that shadowy thing will not go away, a word of advice Don't close your eyes. Jason Hill takes us into a waking nightmare in Michael Johnston's Hi there, sweetie. Hi there, sweetie. Hey, Mom. This thing in my room was not my mother. What are you up to? Sleeping? Yeah. It was 2 a.m. I was in my room. I had woken to the sight of my mother standing at the foot of my bed. Only to the sight, you understand. This was not my mother. How nice. It was standing right up against the foot of my bed leaning over me slightly. We maintained constant eye contact. At that point, neither of us had blinked. It knew that I knew. Can't sleep, Mom? That's right, sweetie. Mommy can't sleep anymore. It was smiling. The corners of its mouth tugged up in a grin too wide to be natural. It spoke cheerfully. We both knew we were playing a game. I spoke slowly. Mom, what are you doing in here? The trick was to see who would blink first. Just watching. The door to my bedroom was directly behind it just to the left of my walk-in closet. To leave my room, I would have to pass right by it. I had yet to actually see it move save for its eyes, which were open far, far too wide. Its gaze followed me eagerly. It's two in the morning, Mom. I tried to smile. Maybe you should go. You're right, sweetie. It is past your bedtime. You should go to sleep. Please, please, make it leave. For a while we said nothing, each of us content in our own stalemate. My eyes were burning, but I didn't dare close them. I didn't know what to do. There was no one to scream to. We lived alone, my mother and I. And screaming would mean forfeiting the game. I glanced at my clock. It read 2.30 a.m. Please, Mom, it's 2.30. I said. Can't you please go? It said nothing. Please, Mom, please go. Please, 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 please. Please leave me alone. Still nothing. Then... 
Okay. Time for bed. Very carefully, without turning around or breaking eye contact, it reached behind it for the closet door, sliding it open soundlessly. When it was fully open, it stepped backwards inside it, settling back until only its smiling face and two wide eyes were visible. Then, equally as careful, it slid the door shut again. Good night, sweetie. Don't blink. Don't blink. Don't blink. The door clicked shut. I lay there for a long time, quietly dying of terror. My eyes were trained in the small gap left by the closet door, watching for movement as I weighed my odds of escaping if I made a run for the door. Paralyzed by my fear, however, I made no such move. I fought against it for a long while, straining every nerve in my body until I had lost all my willpower. Eventually, it became too much. In the end, I blinked. <laughs> and there you have it, children of the dark. Even the comfort of a mother's arms is no safe space in the world of the Simply Scary Podcast. When we return, we will delve into an even darker place. Got on the ground and step away. You're under arrest! Never fails. The minute a guy tries to do something new, people gotta keep bringing up the past. Back so soon, you people never learn, do ya? Good boy. Good boy. Can't be delivery, eh? Sure beats going into town for groceries. <laughs> Come on, boy. Let's get back to the studio. Daddy's got to record some more stories about make-believe monsters. Join us for this newest creation from the Chilling Tales for Dark Knight Studios. South of Sinister. Coming soon. And now it's time to grab you by the pit of your stomach. A word of caution as this story takes you into the twisted mind of a disturbed youth where perceptual dysmorphia instigates a desperately dangerous risk and horrifying consequence. Be warned, this story contains disturbing subject matter and may elicit uneasy reactions. Courtesy of UnsettlingStories.com, Jordan Lester gives a chilling performance of Max Aaron's Teeny Tiny. My doctors asked me to tell my story, so other girls like me could read it and learn from my mistakes, because I'll be dead soon. And that makes me pretty sad to think about. I don't want other girls to be sick like I am. I guess they won't be sick exactly like me, because that would be crazy. But maybe they can read this, so they won't make the bad decisions I made. When I was little, 
Mom used to hold me and say stuff like, Oh, Katie, you fit so perfectly on my lap. You're so teeny tiny. I loved it. She'd keep me warm and hug me, and I felt so great. I'd always go to Mom if I felt sad or scared, and she'd just scoop me up, saying, What's wrong, my teeny tiny girl? And I'd tell her what was making me upset, and she'd always, always, always make it all better. The most vivid memory I have was the day I turned ten. It wasn't of my party, which I vaguely remember being great, and it wasn't of the presents, some of which I still have. It was of when Mom had me in her lap that night and had tears in her eyes and said to Dad, Katie's getting to be a big girl, huh? I don't remember what my dad said, but there was no denying it. I wasn't her teeny tiny girl anymore. At ten years old, I was about 4'10", maybe a hundred pounds. I was growing fast. Both my parents are tall. I remember being scared. The scale kept going up, and by the time I was 11, I was 5'2", 120 pounds, and I started getting boobs. At that point, when I was sad, Mom would hug me tight and say the right things, but it all felt different. She never cradled me. She never had me in her lap. I felt cold and lonely, even though I was never really cold or lonely. I just wanted to be closer to her, like when I was little. So I decided to get little again. Mom started to notice when I pushed around my food on the plate, trying to pile it up on one side to make it look like I ate more than I really did. You're a growing girl, she said, kindly but firmly. You need to eat. I wasn't allowed to leave the table until I was done. That night, after dinner, I remember lying on my back on the bed, staring at the ceiling and feeling the food in my stomach. Mom's words, you're a growing girl, echoed in my mind, and I felt so sick that I ran into the bathroom and threw up. I was really glad I had my own bathroom so they couldn't hear me puking. After I was done, I felt so much better. Lighter and smaller, even. Mom was so happy to see me eating normally again. She had worried aloud that I might be getting the flu, so seeing me chowing down like my old self pushed those worries right out of her head. What she didn't see was how I went to bed afterward, and while the bathwater ran, I was throwing it all up. I did this every day, for years. One of the sad truths about throwing up your meals is that you don't lose all that much weight. I actually gain more. Sure, I'd get rid of what I'd eaten, but probably twice a week I'd be lying in bed, wide awake, fingering my collarbones, hip bones, and ribs, and obsessing over food. Something inside me would snap and I'd run to the fridge or the cabinets and eat until I felt like I was bursting. Then, exhausted, I'd go back upstairs and pass out on my bed. Calorie for calorie, after those twice-weekly binges, I was eating more than I would if I had been healthy. Except I really, really wasn't healthy. And nobody knew. All this built up to the last few months after I graduated high school. I was 5'11", 175 pounds, 17 years old. There was absolutely nothing I hated more than my body. I was constantly lonely and wanted to try to take my mind off it all. 
I decided to get a job. When I told Mom I found a position at a place that recycles old medical gear, she was really proud of me for taking the initiative. It was bittersweet. I knew she was starting to see me as an adult, not her teeny tiny girl. I felt like a complete and utter failure. The recycling place where I worked dismantled big machines that hospitals used and sold the parts. I was the receptionist. I took phone calls and helped set up deliveries. The people I worked with were really nice, and after a few weeks they gave me a key so I could get there early and have their coffee ready and their work orders printed out. That night, after everyone had left, I went back there and let myself in. I still feel bad about breaking their trust. A couple days earlier, my coworkers were bringing in an old machine. They all were wearing heavy gloves and had on breathing gear like scuba divers. When they were done, I asked what it was. Apparently, it was something hospitals use to give radiation therapy to cancer patients. I didn't know too much about that, so when I got home, I went on Wikipedia and did a lot of research. And then I got my idea. When I let myself in that night, the place was empty. I made a beeline for where they had that radiation therapy machine, and I investigated it. Most of it was completely dismantled. What I was looking for was conveniently labeled and brightly marked in a massive lead container. It took me a while to get the cover off. Lead is so heavy. But after I did, I saw a round metal part that looked like a wheel. I picked it up, rotated the mechanism, and opened a little window in the front. A faint blue light was inside. I held it up to my eye and looked in. Nothing but that light. I thought it was probably what I was looking for. I brought the object home with me and locked the door of my bedroom. I worked to pry the thing open with a screwdriver, but it seemed to be locked from the inside. Eventually, I got frustrated and I turned the wheel again to open the window and pushed my screwdriver into the blue light stuff and tried scooping it out. It turned out to be pretty soft. A lot of it broke as I poked it with the screwdriver, and when I turned the wheel upside down, it tumbled out onto my desk. Now I could see how pretty it was. It was like chunks of glowing blue clay and sand. I gathered it up as best I could and put it away, save for the little bit I was going to use that night. One of the things I'd read about radiation therapy was that it made the poor people with cancer really skinny. They just totally lost their appetites. I couldn't believe it was true. I'd always had such a big appetite. I kept telling myself that I needed to be really careful when I took the stuff, because if I got too much of the radiation, I could get cancer myself. I took a pinch of the blue stuff, put it in my mouth, and swallowed it with a gulp of water. It felt warm going down, even though the water was cold. Since I'd gotten home from the recycling place, I'd been pretty warm, in fact. Cozy. Like a little puppy under a blanket. That night, I woke up sweating worse than I'd ever sweated in my life. The bed was totally soaked. Gross. I figured weight loss was weight loss. Water weight wasn't really what I wanted, but it was better than nothing. I took a shower and changed the sheets and went back to bed. My stomach ached a little. When I woke up the next morning, my stomach hurt and I threw up a couple times. But I wasn't even remotely hungry. That alone made the pain in my tummy pretty much go away. I didn't need to eat. Mom asked if I was bringing leftovers to work from last night's dinner, and I lied and said we were going to get a pizza. I hate lying to Mom, but I didn't want her to worry. There was no need to tell her that I wasn't hungry. At work, they'd finished disassembling the machine and started sending it out to wherever they send those things. I'd been really careful to put the canister back exactly as I left it. No one checked to see if the little wheel was still there. The next few days were uneventful, aside from 
my stomach ache getting worse and having to puke once or twice. I had barely eaten anything since I started taking the radiation medicine. Whenever I got woozy from lack of food, I ate an apple or a fat-free yogurt and I was fine. I was still sweating a lot. When I got on the scale, it said 168. After a week of eating nearly nothing and faithfully taking my radiation medicine nightly, my stomach ache got really, really bad. I'd stopped throwing up, but this time it felt like I needed to go to the bathroom. I went, and it was awful. There was so much. I was shocked. I had apparently eaten and kept down more than I thought. It was agony coming out, too. I got on the scale after, though, and that helped me feel a lot better. 161. Over the next couple days, one or two people told me how pretty I looked. They asked me if I lost weight, and I said, yeah, maybe a few pounds. I beamed. Over my whole adolescence, I'd done nothing but get bigger. And now, finally, I was shrinking and on the way to teeny tiny. I didn't feel too great, though. My tummy was constantly having me run to the bathroom, and it still hurt afterwards. I figured I was getting rid of all the extra fat. 158. I was in the shower about ten days after I started taking the medicine, and I was horrified to see some of my hair coming out. That was bad. Really, really, really bad. I stopped washing it immediately and just let the water rinse away the remainder of the shampoo. I got out of the shower and took nearly an hour blow-drying my hair because I was too scared to use a towel that might pull more out. When the mirror was unfogged and my hair was dry, I checked to see how noticeable it was. There was a good-sized patch of bare red scalp about two inches wide above my left ear. I pushed the hair around it down to cover the patch. Some more fell out. It had to be a nutritional deficiency from all the meals I'd been missing. I put on my Titan's hat and got dressed. When I brushed my teeth, I noticed a little blood in the sink. I made a note to get some multivitamins after work. I didn't shower the next day, because when I woke up that morning, there was more hair on my pillow. My scalp was getting pretty visible. It looked prickly and raw, but it didn't hurt. Since I was off work, I stayed at home and looked online for all the nutritional deficiencies that might cause my hair to fall out and my gums to bleed. Most of the ones were covered by my multivitamin, so I tripled the amount I took just to be on the safe side. I had to go to the bathroom five times during the 15 hours I was awake. By the last time, I was incredibly lightheaded and so thirsty. I weighed myself before I started downing water and my radiation medicine. 150. The medicine had helped me lose 25 pounds in less than two weeks. Mom hugged me the next morning before I went to work. She ran her hands up and down my back and she remarked about how skinny I'd gotten. Then. She said it. Remember when I used to call you my teeny tiny girl? I miss those days. But I love you just as much as a grown-up. Then she let me go. Pain. Nausea and despair washed over me. All of a sudden, my lightheadedness came back with a vengeance and I stumbled and fell on the kitchen floor. My hat fell off. With my head spinning, I vaguely remember Mom gasping, Katie, what happened to your hair? Before I violently threw up on the floor and myself. It was all blood. I passed out to the sound of Mom screaming. I don't know how much time went by at the hospital. 
I wasn't completely unconscious, but all I remember up until recently, when they used drugs to wake me up, were images of doctors in the same scuba gear as the guys at work, and saying weird words like casium chloride and sloft and gray that didn't mean the color. Today, I can't move or talk. And I communicate using a cool keyboard that can pick out letters using the movements of my remaining eye. Like I said in the beginning, I'll be dead soon. I'm not too fun to look at anymore. My hair's gone. And my lower jaw. And my skin. The nice doctors are giving me medication that helps me manage the pain and keep me alert. They asked if they could do tests and experiments on me to help understand what ingestion of the radiation medicine does to the human body. Apparently, there was a man in Japan a few years ago named Hiroshi Uchi who got a similar level of exposure, and the same stuff happened to him. They said it would help other people in the future if they could compare our two cases. Of course I let them. I can't eat food anymore. My esophagus got cooked away. Same with my stomach. The doctors are keeping me hydrated with a tube. I don't really like to think about it. I guess all the excitement I get as I wait here is when they weigh me every six hours to see if I'm able to retain the fluids they give me or if it all seeps out into the sheets. They hoist me onto a pad and a little machine voice says a number. This morning it said 72. Next time it was 69. Mom and Dad have to wear those scuba suits when they come visit. Mom's always crying because she's not allowed to touch me. Dad just stares. Right before I started writing this, Mom bent down and started whispering to me some of the stuff I remember her saying when I was small. I closed my eye and imagined being warm and safe on her lap. I love you, my teeny tiny girl. She sobbed. I would have smiled if I had a mouth. It is frightening sometimes at how easily human behavior can be misread. A simple misjudgment of context can sometimes result in unalterable tragedy. Oh, my listener, we have only just begun this hellish exploration. Oh, my listener, we have only just begun this hellish exploration, so don't lose your resolve yet. There is so much more in store for you when we return. If you enjoyed Max Aaron's story, be sure to go to unsettlingstories.com after the show to enjoy some of the most horrific stories found online. UnsettlingStories.com Bring the nightmare to your home computer. For the final leg of our exhumation vacation, we will take you to a place of fun and frolic that promises to be everything the highway billboards told you it would be. If you make it out alive. It is important to note that in this long history of this story's telling and retelling, that the Simply Scary podcast was the first to actually make contact with this very prolific author for permission to produce this masterpiece of horror splendor. 
So we are proud to extend our humble gratitude to the slime beast himself for his gracious donation of this meaty morsel to our hungry audience. We are proud to present an online classic with Nick Goroff's performance of horror author extraordinaire Slime Beasts, Whimsy Wood. I always hated road trips. I'm not using the term hate lightly. I've always absolutely hated long car rides, especially as a child. The hours on end spent cramped in the back of a vehicle drove me to the brink of adolescent madness. The sound of the road always seemed just loud enough to make it impossible to carry on a conversation with my parents up front. That's how desperate I'd get for any kind of break from the monotony. I'd actually wish I could hear my parents. Sometimes my mom would try to make the trips a little less unbearable for the sake of all three of us. She'd sometimes buy me a stack of comic books or a couple new action figures and hide them until the dreaded day would arrive. Unbeknownst to her, I knew about them well in advance and would usually end up looking at them beforehand, completely sabotaging her attempts. I guess I've just always really hated waiting. I'm going to tell you about one of these trips, the most mind-numbingly boring trip up to that point, from my home in New York to my grandparents' house in Arizona. Yes, we drove to Arizona, and I'd already read all the comics days earlier. We stopped at a couple hotels for the night along the way, and I got to stretch my legs in school playgrounds if we happened to pass one when it was closed, but the majority of my time, for days straight, was spent seated and upright with my seatbelt on, enveloped in the unforgiving drone of tires on pavement. I don't even know what state we were in when I saw the first billboard. It was weather-worn, its paint peeling, and was mostly obscured by overgrown trees. It would have been utterly unremarkable if it had not been for the image it offered. Written in large, multicolored, balloon-like letters, and set above the upturned head of a unicorn, was the word Whimsywood. As we whipped past the sign, I had just enough time to catch the small text below the mythical creature's image. Games, rides, animals, family fun, 25 miles ahead. Mom! I shouted, as loud as I could, overtaking the tires drone by several decibels. Mom! Mom! There's a park! She had seen it. Both my parents had. My father, who had been driving at the time, took his eyes off the road for a split second, and I watched as the two exchanged an unsure glance. It was a look I understood, despite having never seen it before. They didn't want to stop there. Mom! I must have sounded incredibly pathetic, even though I wasn't trying, because she turned back with a smile. Okay, if it's open, we will stop and see how much it costs to get in. That was all I needed to hear. Moments later, I was bounding in my seat, utterly enthused. I felt renewed, sharper, and more alert after enduring the seemingly endless highway for far too long. I watched the occasional car pass by and looked into their windows whenever possible. I looked for another kid like me, maybe coming back from the park. If I had seen a single kid with a whimsy wood pennant or an oversized stuffed animal or even a simple smile on their face, I would have known the park was open. Every car that passed, however, was empty. Well, except for the grown-ups, but who cared about them? I tried to convince myself that the random sights on the side of the road were signs the park was indeed open. A soiled baby doll with a hole in its face, a colorful blanket fluttering in the branches of a dead tree, even a sock monkey reclining on the road's center divider line. There were enough children passing through to leave those signals, so I was more and more convinced this was going to be awesome. A second billboard was passed. The same whimsy wood logo, the same unicorn's head, the same state of disrepair. Hanging off the billboard was a small wooden sign painted with red letters. Open! Mom! Dad! I know. I saw it. My dad turned to Mom again with a chuckle. Well, I guess we're going. 
The final Whimsy Wood sign stood at the end of a gravel driveway that trailed the long way off behind the tree line. The sign was much like the billboards, but despite being in better repair, it actually seemed even older. The lettering was hand-painted in an old-timey style, and the text beneath the unicorn's head differed slightly. Games of chance, mechanical rides, rare animals, wholesome fun for Junior and Sis. Dad didn't really like the idea of taking the gravel stretch. He grumbled and complained the whole way down as the tires crunched stone and kicked things up into the undercarriage. I heard a few curse words in there, but all I cared about was the fast approaching fun. Past the trees, the Whimsywood Park was spectacular. On the drive-in, we were overlooking the entirety of the property. Several cleared acres with a short, long building, essentially acting as a gateway between the downward-sloping driveway and the gaming booths, petting zoo, and carnival rides towards the back. I was probably vibrating at a dangerous frequency at this point, like I was on the world's biggest sugar rush. Wow. It's actually pretty nice. Dad started the car down the slope toward the parking lot with a deep sigh. The parking lot was about half filled with cars, which was probably a bit surprising to my parents. The minivans and station wagons scattered throughout the gravel expanse proved that, yes, Whimsy Wood was open. I didn't think anything of it, though, racing to the front doors of the building to see if they were locked. Hey. Dad called out as I bolted forward. I froze in place, thought about what I must have done wrong, and sheepishly made the walk back to his side. Together, the three of us approached the building. More waiting. Dad pulled the door open and held it for Mom and I. Me first, of course. There was a wooden box by the front door that simply read, Pay what you can. Five dollars for everyone over three suggested. I thought I saw Dad slip a ten dollar bill and thought about protesting my age, but I was too excited to get inside. The interior of the building was dark lit up by a row upon row of arcade game cabinets and neon signs that hung on the walls. The signs weren't for any specific products, but were more along the lines of general concepts. Fun, groovy, and tubular, and stuff like that. One that sticks in my mind just confusingly read, Superpower. I hadn't really been to an arcade yet at that time, so this had my jaw dragging on the floor. Now that we were indoors and there was no chance of getting backed over by a van, I was free to run around like a lunatic. I was quickly lost amid the beeps and shrieks of computerized music of uh, about a hundred video games. I checked them all out. A centipede-like game called Skull and Crossbow caught my attention the most. It had a little boy with a crossbow at the bottom of the screen, firing upwards as skeletons and skulls rolled across a graveyard, inching closer and closer to him. I ran back to my parents, and Mom already had a handful of quarters prepared for me. I played it for a while, but couldn't get very far without dying, so that fun was over pretty quick. When I returned to my parents this time, they were talking with a third adult. She was a squat, heavy-set woman with stringy black hair and nasty, neat black dress clothes. She wore a unicorn horn on her forehead, attached with an elastic band. Well, Dad said to the round lady, Here's the boy. The way he said it was the same as saying, Okay, here's my way out of this conversation. The round lady turned and leaned down to face level with me. Her face was wrinkled, worn, old like the signs. Hello. She said hello to me with a large yellowish smile, and her breath smelled like urine. I didn't answer her, instead cleaving to Mom's leg. He's shy. It was... Nice, talking to you. We quickly exited and walked to the large clearing behind the building. Who was that? I finally asked when we were out of earshot. She works here, Dad said flatly. He paused and added, Couldn't get a word in edgewise. We took a few steps before Mom and Dad exchanged the agitated look once again. For about 15 minutes I ran from one attraction to the next as Dad repeatedly checked his watch. I didn't care. This was my one chance to actually enjoy myself. I wanted to take Dad's watch and smash it. I wanted to stay here, not go to stupid Arizona. The petting zoo had the usual fare. Goats, chickens, and a hell of a lot of feces. 
An old man sat on a hay bale in the center of the petting zoo as other kids around my age harassed the birds and acted wary of the goats. The old man was dressed a lot like the round woman, right down to the plastic unicorn horn on his head. He smiled at me. After I did the customary amount of petting and stepping in feces, the old man beckoned me over. I kept a safe distance from him, but I did approach. As I stood a couple of feet from the old man, he cast his gaze down on the straw beneath his feet. I did the same. Then he swept a bit of straw aside. Just beneath was one of the chickens. It was motionless, its head twisted several times around. Jostled by the old man kicking at the straw, a few maggots twisted and turned out of the creature's beak. I locked eyes with the old man, who was smiling. Don't tell the other kids. They'll all want to see. He put his finger to his leathery, black speckled lips as if to shush me. I always loved animals, and even if I hadn't, this would have still been disturbing. I ran back to my mom with such an awkward gait that she instinctively knew to kneel down and catch me as I reached her. What? What is it? There's a dead chicken. Oh. It was... it was under the straw by that man. Well, I'm sure he'll get rid of it. Sometimes animals get old. And they pass on. Remember, we talked about that? As you no doubt already know, that wasn't the problem I was having with the whole situation. Still, I didn't really have the mental tools to figure out exactly how I should clarify the situation. I held hands with Mom and Dad, almost hanging between them as I decided what I wanted to do next in the park. That's when an announcement echoed through the park, carried by rattling tinny loudspeakers mounted on telephone poles. Well, well, well! Welcome, The announcer did a passable, goofy impression, mixed with the hype style of an ad for a monster truck rally. How about that? You want to do that? I felt a little less sick now, almost entirely forgetting anything was wrong in the first place. Sure. I perked up. The timber tunnel was like any given theme park tunnel ride. A metal track, a roller coaster style cart, and a long tunnel the tracks led into. The mouth of the tunnel bore flat, plywood trees and a stand up cutout of a burly lumberjack that looked like it had been left out in the rain for about a century. It was faded and worn, most of its facial features missing aside from the thick beard. I got into the cart at about the back. Other kids were already piling in, and there was a real sense that I might get shoved or kicked if I tried to work my way in any sooner than I did. The round woman was standing by the cart, making sure everyone was safe and secure by manhandling them to see if they'd come loose from the cart. Nearby, two people in a less than convincing two-man unicorn costume pranced and trotted around, the lead man making whinnying snorting sounds. Next to me in the car, there was a dweeby kid with coke bottle glasses and a green and white striped shirt. He had a blob of snot rolling down his upper lip, which he would continually snort back up as he looked around in wonder. If this kid smiled any wider, his head would have fallen off. When the round woman finally worked her way to the back of the car, she jerked and jostled me roughly, her hands darting from my arms to my chest to my leg and bumping my crotch in a way that gave me a fleeting feeling of extreme unease. It happened so quickly that she was already moving on before I could even croak out a word. And with that, the cart was off. All the kids waved to their parents who waved back again. My hands were solidly on the metal bar that held kids in place as I stared toward my parents, still dumbfounded by what had just happened. Mom and Dad waved their look of happiness turning to concern over my appearance just as I disappeared into the tunnel. After this all happened, all I wanted was to forget the song. It issued from unseen speakers over and over again with no variation. It was set way too loud, 
and a couple kids ahead of me clasped their hands over their ears. Most just laughed, and one said, It's not bad. You guys are gay. We passed painted pictures of forest landscapes and little animatronic lumberjacks. They had about the same range of animation as desktop drinking bird toys, and were about the same size. It was like being on the train in a miniature train set. As we rounded a curve, the song loop sped up like the cassette tape was being played in fast forward. The screeching, high-pitched voice was ear-splitting. Now all the kids were covering their ears. I looked at the little mechanical people as we continued through the ride. They were moving faster as well, blindingly fast. Faster than a tiny tin toy should realistically be able to move without flying free of their hinges. As we continued, the lumberjacks were cutting other things. Farm animals. People. Tiny lumberjacks had moved into a small settlement of log cabins and were relentlessly, eternally hacking away at tiny failed people. Blood spurts made of red metal wire jiggled this way and that as the torturous murders commenced. The lights went out. The song still played. Still way too fast and way too loud. I felt my pants getting wet. The cart shook. It shook with increasing severity, like someone jostled the front car, then the middle, working their way back. Suddenly, something hit me in the jaw very hard, like an uppercut. I felt something lash my face as well. It was like being hit from underneath by a child's shoe, foot and all, with the laces following suit. It was almost like someone had flown past while kicking out violently. Reeling from the shocking blow, I slipped beneath the safety bar and crumpled to the floor of the cart. I cried out, but the music drowned the sound. I felt across the floor for help from the boy next to me, but I found only empty space from wall to wall within the cart. The music finally ceased, and everything was deathly quiet. Sniveling in the dark, I remained quiet. I didn't even breathe deeply. I listened for any sign of where everyone had gone or why they'd left. All I heard was a sound like a restaurant full of customers obnoxiously slurping soup mixed with the absent, brainless chewing of a group of cattle. It wasn't loud, but in the darkness it seemed to echo all around me. The lights never came back on, but thankfully the cart had continued to move throughout this ordeal. Soon I saw daylight as I emerged from the other end of the tunnel, still hunched down on the floor and clutching my swollen jaw. When I realized I was most likely past the danger, or at least assumed I was, I boldly popped my head out of the cart and looked around, the sunlight burning my unadjusted eyes. I was alone. I don't mean I was alone in the car, though I was, but rather that there was absolutely nobody around. Not a single parent was there to greet anyone coming off the ride. The car was still moving when I rolled myself over the side and landed on the ground hard. I was frantic at this point, nearly crying. I moved as fast as I could through the grounds, making a beeline away from the timber tunnel and toward the long building at the front of the park. The petting zoo was empty, except for the animals. Everything was empty. The game booths displayed unguarded prizes, and the other rides whirred and click-clacked with no passengers and no operators. As I moved through the arcade building, I made sure to stop at each row of cabinets to see if my parents had come in there for some unknown reason. It was just as desolate as the rest of the place. When I reached the parking lot, that's when relief finally washed over me. There were my mom and dad, walking toward our car. The other parents were here as well, doing much the same. Mom, Dad! Nothing. Not even a hesitation in their step. Mom? I repeated in a desperate tone. When I caught up with them, I slipped between them and took their hands again. They both gasped and shocked and looked down at me as if some sort of otherworldly creature had suddenly grabbed onto me. <gasps> Hey, hey buddy. where were you? Mom said, almost as if she was remembering something from far away in the past. Mom! 
Mom, I was in the tunnel! You left me in the tunnel! Mom, where are you going? The tunnel? She repeated, seeming mystified. The tunnel, Dad said as he grinned at Mom. We left him in the tunnel. <laughs> he was making fun of me, acting like I wasn't making sense and like I was doing it on purpose. It made me so mad, I could actually hear my own pulse. Dad, you did! I never convinced them. To this day, I've never convinced them of any of it. Even though we all got to the car and drove up that slope out of Whimsywood, ten seconds later, they acted like they'd never even heard of the place. They acted as if there had been no interruption in the trip. Mom even said I dreamed it. We were right in the middle of talking about Whimsywood. She had just said it seemed like a nice place, even if it was a bit run down, and the next moment she was talking about it being something I'd dreamt. I watched another car behind us that had just come from the park as well, without the child that had been riding along less than an hour earlier. Out of the passenger side window came a stuffed rabbit, a juice cup, a coloring book. By the time we reached Arizona, the combination of my parents' insistence that I dreamt it all, combined with the monotony of the remaining trip, had worn me down. I really started considering the idea that it hadn't been real. I almost had myself fooled until the trip home. On the way back, we passed the billboards again. Games, rides, animals, family fun, 25 miles ahead. Hey, look! Mom said. You've been really good. You want to stop there on the way? Much to her surprise, I declined. How many souls have been and will be lost to the world of Whimsywood? You may have had a brother or sister yourself that fell victim to this mysterious unamusement park. But then again, you would never know, would you? Don't go away, for we have more in store down our dark boardwalk of doom. The Simply Scary Podcast, Season 2, Episode 4. Become a patron today and you'll get the extended version of this show. Here's a sample of the extra stories you get when you become a member. At about 7 p.m., Dr. Tanner returned to the room carrying two plates of mashed potatoes and chicken strips. I finally gathered up the courage to ask him how long I'd be staying in this room. Well, about a month. Give or take a few weeks. I just have some work I need to do. You can't make that move. Weren't you listening at all? Well, were you? I shook my head. Darren swung his arm across the board, and the pieces went sailing across the room. He began to pound on the table angrily. The rules are simple, Benjamin. Simple. Why don't you just listen, Benjamin? Why? He then stood up and smacked me across the face. Become a member today. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com forward slash tour to get more horror than you can handle. As we close for tonight, let me first thank all of you for your diligent work in getting the Kickstarter campaign for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, the animated series, off to a rousing start. But there is more work to do. You have given and you have shared, but now you have to get it out to your favorite podcast, celebrity, TV station, radio station, or anywhere else you can share. 
You can get the word out, and you can be the one who says, I was part in making Chilling Tales for Dark Nights the animated series happen. Go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com forward slash animation and share our devious press conference video with everyone you know. And remember, it is extremely important that you allow the ads to play through in our YouTube videos and occasionally click on them to assert your viewership power. This is a way for you to lend your support without opening your wallet. Become a patron today and you will have access to an extended broadcast of this show featuring stories not included in the public YouTube release. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click on Patrons at the top of the page to take the tour and to get access to all our content and unreleased material that you will find nowhere else. And now, to make you, the audience, a part of the show by choosing one of your YouTube comments and reading it on the air and bestowing on you a fiendish reward. This episode's winning comment comes from Bruce Forte. And Bruce has a question. Why do you guys always respond to the comments? Also, I love the banter with the henchmen at the beginning of the episode. An excellent question, Bruce. The cast and crew of the Simply Scary Podcast, myself included, and the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights team take the time to visit with the fans in the comments section because that is where we make our connection with you, the audience. Ever since Chilling Tales for Dark Nights started way back in 2012, we have made an effort to keep in touch with the fans, say thank you, and get important feedback and insight for the direction of our future. Also, it gives the individual talents involved a chance to touch base with the fans and do some necessary outreach to the listeners. It also provides an opportunity for individual performers like me to promote our other endeavors, like the Horror Readings by GM Danielson YouTube channel. We encourage you to support all of us here in spreading our brand of horror worldwide. As for the henchmen, I always love to think of myself as an evil overlord. But alas, the brainwashing, spells, and voodoo rituals have not brought those two under control yet. They are forces of nature unto their own. But Bruce, we will need you to send us a screenshot of your YouTube account page with your name pictured to contact at simplyscarypodcast.com in order to claim your wicked prize. For the rest of you superfans, don't forget to stop by and share www.chillingtalesfordarknights.com forward slash animation right after the show. We only have a short time left to get our project funded, so get the word out and help us turn off the lights and turn on the horrifying animation. This is G.M. Danielson, thanking you for joining us. Remember, listeners, those childhood years are not always fond, and the memories can affect you throughout your life. But there is always a darker storm out there on the horizon. So be sure to count your blessings where they lie. Until next time, don't move, don't blink, don't even breathe. But you may cry. For you are experiencing the Simply Scary Podcast. <laughs>This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. 
This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review. Comments or questions, email us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and check our website for more information. While you're there, consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show. Copyright Chilling Entertainment, LLC, 2017. Thanks for listening. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.